Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Wahda, Wassalatu Wassalamu ala manna nabiya ba'da amma ba'd. Fa'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajimi bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim. Wa zakir fa inna zikratan fa al-mu'mineen. Sadaqallahu al-azim. Allahumma salli ala sayyiduna Muhammad wa ala ala sayyiduna Muhammad wa barik wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, all praises to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave us the gift of Iman, who guided us on Deen of Islam, who selected us to be from the Ummah of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A few weeks ago I had mentioned on the program that one of the curriculum I was working on for youth and children, uh, you know, people aged from 10 to 20, but then I realized it would be beneficial for adults, was the main answer to four questions. Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What is Islam? Who was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And what is the Quran? And it's only when we know the answer to these four questions can we answer the question, who am I? Because it's not just a question that affects youth. It's a question that affects people in their old age, middle age crisis, mid -age, midlife crisis, even young professionals. They may not consciously ask this question, but they lose their sense of direction, they lose their sense of purpose, or it begins to fade, it begins to wane. And even at any of those ages, whether a person is their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, older, I feel that it can always be reduced to these four basic questions. Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who is Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? What is Islam? And what is the Quran? And then who am I? And one major aspect of tazkiyah is to purify oneself and one's mind and one's heart from false concepts, from false ideology. And I had mentioned a few weeks ago that this notion of jahiliyyah, and often we hear from people that jahiliyyah just meant that the pre-Islamic Arabs were barbaric in their character and behavior. And no doubt that is true, but jahiliya means the ultimate ignorance. And the ultimate ignorance is to be ignorant of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, who Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, what Islam is, what the Qur'an is, and therefore remaining ignorant about who am I, and what is my purpose of being, and what is my purpose of existence, and what is the purpose of my life, and how will I live my life. And this aspect of tazkiyah, obviously in the intense sense, has to be done before a person accepts iman. But even after a person accepts iman, has iman, is from the mu'mineen, this aspect of tazkiyah must remain. Why? Because there are sometimes vestiges of other ideologies, cultures, civilizations, epistemologies in our mind and heart. Or, as we travel through this dunya, there will be other currents, other factors, other people, other thoughts that will try to influence us and pull us in their direction. So this aspect of tazkiyah, purity of thought and purity of heart from false concepts, false emotions, false ideologies, is an ongoing aspect of tazkiyah. This is separate from purifying ourselves from sin or purifying ourselves from improper behavior in relationships and violations of rights of others that those are all of those things also fall into tazkiyah but what i'm talking about today is purifying our heart and mind now what does this mean obviously we all know who allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is but we forget that we forget, for example, who ma'akum ma ma'kuntum, that he is that being who is with us. He is that being of absolute perfection. He is that being of a perfection, not just that we can conceive, but even greater than anything we conceive. He is the greatest, perfect, possible, conceivable, inconceivable being. He has the most greatest love, the greatest mercy. He has given us the greatest guidance. So this is a perfect example. If a person sometimes feel lost in their life, or now the Billah, they may feel that Allah has forgotten them, or they feel that Allah Ta'ala has become hidden from them, right? Or they feel that they have become distant from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But if they remember who Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is, then they remember that Allah Ta'ala perfectly 
tremendously, always, eternally, infinitely, even more than eternally and infinitely, always perfectly guiding them, always perfectly loving them, always perfectly ma'iyya, always perfectly ever present and aware and intimate with them. Qareeb, Allah Ta'ala's ever, always perfectly, greatly, tremendously, near and intimately close to them. If they were to remember all those things, it would motivate them again. It would give them that passion and feeling. It would give us that passion and emotion and feeling to become strong and steadfast in deen again. But we forget, or this knowledge is in our mind, but it's in the background of our mind. Similarly, when we ask, what does it mean? Who is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi Obviously, all of, know the answer, all of us know the answer to this, that he is our prophet, he is the last and final prophet and messenger. But who is he really? So if we were to remember that he is our Nabi, and what does it mean to accept someone as your Nabi? How perfect a prophet he was, how loving and kind and Rauf and Rahim, although these are names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself in Quran al Karim itself has described Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa with these words, Rauf and Rahim. And that would motivate us, that would remind us. And this is the feeling, by the way, that a person is supposed to feel when they recite salawat, durud sharif, yani uh, salutations and blessings on the beloved Prophet And even if a person is not feeling it at the time they recite this, a person should recite this in order to feel it. So there are only two ways to recite salawat. Either you recite salawat when you're already feeling this feeling, and you recite those beautiful words and phrases and sentences to express this feeling, of love from the Prophet or you find that your heart is lacking or there's a lapse in that feeling and you recite salawat obviously also as a dua and to ask Allah Ta'ala to send his blessings on the beloved messenger but also to ignite those feelings in your heart it's not meant to be a mindless exercise it's not meant to be a recitation to simply reach a particular adad uh, or enumerate a particular count of a hundred or a thousand or whatever it may be and if a person was to feel that and one reason why we don't feel it is because we've forgotten who the prophet muhammad is that's why it's so important to regularly read seerah and regularly read hadith just like we'll come to that when we talk about Quran, but it's important to regularly read Quran also. You know, there are so many people who regularly read the newspaper, regularly surf different Islamic websites, or regularly follow different people on Twitter and Facebook, or regularly read their own email, or regularly track different people. But if you look at their lives, they do not regularly read Quran and ponder upon it, do not regularly go through the entire seerah, do not regularly read hadith. And this is a sign of a person who is you know, an imbalanced person and their understanding of deen is imbalanced and they're obsessed with the state of deen or the people of deen or the reports of deen or the trends in deen uh, or the trendsetters in deen and they're not actually trick learning the deen itself. So there's another thing I would stress it's very important that however if you, if you can't do it every day do it every other day you can't do it 20 minutes do it 10 minutes but we should regularly repeatedly constantly consistently be going through the Quran al-Kareem the seerah and the hadith of Nabi al-Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and if a person the most passive way uh, and the most minimal way if a person is very passive about it is to simply listen to the rules on Quran, the rules on Sira, the rules on Hadith, and try and make note. And as you repeatedly listen to it, because in your life you will constantly be going through different experiences. And so let's say you listen to the whole Sira in 2014, and you listen to it again now in 2020, you will definitely find new aspects of that Sira speaking to you because your own life in 2020 is different than the life you were living and the experiences you went through in 2014. So who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Now let me show you some aspect of tazkiyah because we need to purify ourselves of the incorrect concepts that Allah ta'ala, na'udhu billah, Allah ta'ala doesn't care or he's not there or he's not guiding or why is this happening to me or he's upset with me or I don't understand or when will it happen? Or why will it not happen? Or why did it happen? And these are all things that if we knew that Allah, if we remembered that Allah Ta'ala is the being who is perfect, 
perfect in his knowledge, perfect in his guidance, perfect in his power, perfect in his wisdom, perfect in his love, perfect in his mercy. So you're, when you're talking about absolute, pure, immaculate, limitless, infinite perfection, then none of these questions arise. He is infinitely, perfectly near to me. How can I ever feel distant to him? Now, that doesn't mean the question may be correct that I feel distant to Allah Ta'ala, but the answer was wrong that it had something to do with Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala. So then a person will, when they purify themselves of that false notion, they will arrive at the correct understanding. It has to do with me. I'm becoming distant. I'm missing my Fajr Salah. I'm neglecting Quran. I no longer make dua. I don't think about Allah Ta'ala. I don't do dhikr. I don't remember Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala. Or I'm not obeying Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala. Or I'm disobeying Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala. Those were the answers. There's a long, you know, that's a long list and there's more. But one of the things that's not an answer is that Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala is distant from me. And that's why I said we have to first understand who Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala is before we can understand who we are. It is only when we have the correct answers about who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is will we be able to figure out the correct answers of who we are. And this is one major aspect of Tazkiyah. This is why Nabi Karim Sallallahu continually, it wasn't just that he taught Sahaba that Allah ta'ala exists and he is one. That's not it. There's so much more in the Quran al Karim, so much more in the Hadith, so much more in the lived example of the way the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi did tawakkul, trusted upon Allah ta'ala pleaded to pray and made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sahaba saw all of that also so it has to be clear what's something that's not been 100% accurately captured in the textual record of history that is in the text, the written books and documents of Sirah and the written ahadith is this experience and that's called the sohbah, that's why there's sahaba you see, we, me and you, we can read the same Qur'an al Kareem, obviously, that the Sahaba did. Let's say we can read all the Hadith, and we know all the Hadith that the Sahaba did. Let's say we read all the Sirah, and we know all the Sirah the way the Sahaba did, the facts about it, the timeline. But what we can never have is the lived experience. And especially what they saw, is they saw, and they witnessed, and they experienced, and they felt in their heart, how Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu himself lived Islam. That's something that we can't replicate. That's the, that was the concept originally of Sohbah. Now, unfortunately, there are almost hardly any mashaykh of that level alive today that one would really want to spend so much time with them because one feels that their life and their lived experience is some, you know, reflection, some refraction, even a drop, but some shade of resemblance to the lived life of Sahaba Kiram and their own Radiallahu Ta'ala on Majmain and their own lived life was a reflection of Nabi Kareem Sandallah Sallam. But that is also an important part of Tazkiyah because when we live in our own lives in our own bubbles, then our Sohba becomes the laptop or the cell phone or entertainment or media, fashion, culture, society, sports. All of these things are you know, I sometimes just call it the feed. All of these things are feeding. You know, our current 2020 lifestyle is very much like what people used to imagine in the 1950s or 1980s in science fiction. That constantly being barraged with so much information. And a lot of that is based on false concepts. A lot of that media and entertainment is based on either denial of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's all there. It's embedded in all of these things that we receive in the feed. So this is very important. And sometimes, you know, to do this type of tazkiyah, you have to disconnect. You know, yes, it would be nice to connect to some live sohba, but like I mentioned earlier, to connect to the Quran, the seerah, and the sunnah, but also to disconnect. And to disconnect from the external things that are part of the feed, but also sometimes to take a step back and distance ourselves from our own lives, our own predicaments. Uh, because our own, how can I explain this, the experiences that we go through in our life are not the be-all and all of our life. The be-all and end all of our life is the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our pledge of Iman in Him, our belief in Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa the teachings of Deen of Islam, the teachings of Quran, that is the be-all and end all of our life. Not what I'm going through, what I have to do, all that is important, what I have to do for my spouse, my children, I have to earn, all the things that we do, yes, but that's not the real purpose of our life. Those are all incidentals. 
And this is something you see, this is why I was explaining the live life. This is something that Sayyidina Rasulullah transferred. Whether you want to call he ignited a flame or a fire or a passion in the hearts and breasts of the Sahaba Kiram with the Allah Ta'ala's mind, but their concept of life was radically different from any set of humanity. We don't find, you know, there's small mention of the Hawariyun and the Ansar of Nabi Isa alayhi salam, but otherwise if you look close at the Sahaba Kahaf, but otherwise if you look closely in Quran, you don't find any community like that, 120,000 Sahaba Kiram, that's an Ummah whose entire concept of life was purified. That all, any and all false concepts, false ideas, false emotions was entirely purified. No materialism, no hedonism, no, you know, it, it's, it's a unique thing in the entire history of humanity. And this is why Allah SWT mentioned this as a major mission of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Right, that uh, Yatu alayhim ayati that you will recite to them, that he will recite to them the verses of revelation, Quran al Karim, will use the key him and he will keep throughout the Prophet Sallallahu life, he will keep purifying the Sahaba, their minds and their hearts, as well as yes, their actions and akhlaq. And I have even witnessed this in, in, in several people, a fair amount of people, that yes, no doubt for some people, for many of us, the type of people who me and the type of our listeners for us, it's about purifying ourselves of sin, right? Or, you know, bad akhlaq. But for many people, when they come to Islam, it was just this, not just converts and reverts, but even people who came to the later in their life, they just had to be purified of the false concepts. As soon as their false understandings went away, Alhamdulillah, mashallah, they became so strong in deen. The purity of the pure fitra and the true deen came out. <laughs> So here, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa What is Qur'an? And the reason why I separate this out a little bit from what is Islam. Because this is a very important. What is the concept of revelation? What is the concept of wahi? And this is, you know, these are two things where, all of these three things are actually where Islam is unique. I mean, original Christianity, which was the original revealed true Christianity, may have been similar. But today's contemporary Christianity is so different. Their concept of God and Trinity and the incarnation and personhood of Nabi Isa alayhi salam and to Jesus Christ. They don't have a robust understanding of Nabuwa because they don't, obviously they don't believe in Nabi Isa alayhi salam as a prophet. And even their understanding of scripture revelation, the way they approach the Bible is so radically different from our understanding of Quran. So these are very, very powerful things. And these are things that Allah Ta'ala revealed in their true form to all of the true early revealed religions. And we also have to think that these were the things that were corrupted. So let me say something that if you just understand it in the context of everything I said up till now. For Christians, the concept of prayer in the sense that they do pray to God, that's not so corrupted. The concept of prayer, they turn in yearning, they have love for God, they ask for the mercy and forgiveness of God. What was corrupted was their God concept, the concept of God itself. Yes, they have many incorrect rites and rituals in their worship, but generally the feelings of worship are the same, submission, yearning, love, repentance, seeking forgiveness. It's the concept of God that had been corrupted. Their feelings for Nabi Isa are very good, like ishq feelings that one would have for the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Their love for Isa salam, their view that he was a great person, but their concept that he was so close to God, but it's their concept of Nabuwa that got corrupted and then they started thinking that Nabi Isa is not just a prophet, but he has some level of divinity, God who trinity him. It's the concepts. We also have to look at Shaitan. What does Shaitan corrupt in people? He corrupts their concepts. So this is very, very important of Tazkiyah. Now within our deen, so when I say now the fourth thing was what is Islam? And this is something that the Ummah, and I'm not talking about debates on whether to raise the hands or lower the hands. I'm talking about, unfortunately, throughout the history of our Ummah, except maybe the earliest period, there has been a corruption of concepts as well. And this has happened in the Sawaf also. There have been times when people of the Sawaf, and not, most often not the Shaykhs, but most often the followers, began to corrupt their concepts. Today also, we find all types of strange and incorrect and sometimes outright false understandings of the Sawaf in the Muslim world within the Ummah. 
I even find it among some scholars, among some good practitioners of Islam, certainly imbalanced understandings, skewed understandings. So our concepts of deen is very, very important. And you can never ground your concepts in deen properly unless you're grounded in the Qur'an, the Sunnah, and the Seerah. So who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa What is Islam? A yeah, first and foremost concept really about this, and not what I was talking about earlier. The most important concept is what does it mean to believe a religion, to be a believer? To have a way of life that you will submit to, to have a concept of Surat al Mustaqim, to have a concept of Hidayah, to have a concept of Deen, to always be worried and wary about Zalal, about misguidance, about going astray, about Ghafla and Lao, about futile activities. This, this is Deen. This is the whole understanding. And Alhamdulillah, this is also what we've seen is that so many people are lost simply because they don't understand what deen is, what it means to believe in a religion. So many secular or non-practicing cultural Muslims, it's not that they're bad people, they just were never taught what Islam is, even though they say I'm Muslim. They don't understand what it means to believe in a deen, how dominant that it should be in one's life, how that should overrule and trump any and all concerns of a person's dunya, their worldly life, they, they don't have the concept of deen. Their concept of deen is just something that we were born into and yes, we nominally affiliate. It's like an affiliation. It's not a passion. It's not their mission. It's just an affiliation. Yes, I affiliate and identify myself as a Muslim in terms of if I have to tick a box in the senses or in the sense that I celebrate Eid, that I don't celebrate Christmas, or I don't eat pork. There's a few, you know, indicators of that affiliation and that's what they think deen is they don't and even some even some people who pray five times a day even they don't understand what deen is for them they just alhamdulillah they have more indicators they have more boxes they check so for one for them it's also pray five times a day fast them with the ramadan go on hajj once a year pay zakat annually if it's due right but even that is not the full understanding of deen it's still not the correct concept of deen and you will find people you know, you find Muslims, whether Muslim countries or non-Muslim countries, who may pray five times a day and fast Ramadan and go for Eid Salah and etc. But the rest of their life is an entirely Western, or what now people call the global monoculture life. The rest of their life is fully about entertainment, pastimes. They're fully connected to the feed. And, and, and then they end up falling in disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then they feel distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then sometimes they're in danger of even losing or lapsing some of those basics that we're doing. So this is tazkiyah of concepts. This is something to make a lot of dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. And to be strong and steadfast. And you know, there was a time in my life, maybe I would say about 10 years ago, uh, especially, you know, maybe I would say from 2010 to 15, that I would sometimes, in my heart, and Allah, Allah, maybe if I ever spoke about it, I would sometimes critically view certain communities who I felt had isolated themselves. Uh, and they lived in a, in a very, very, very isolated, closed circuit world. Uh, but now, you know, when I look back, sometimes I think that we have to respect that. And we have to honor and value that because that is the way they themselves are saving themselves and their children or that is where perhaps Allah Ta'ala is saving them. It may not be the path for everyone to take. It might not even be a possible path unless you live in one of those countries that has these very, very intense, int densely populated, close-knit, cultural often as well uh, communities. But there is a sense there that if there's a sense of a withdrawal and detachment that we also need to uh, adopt in order to have this tazkiyah. My point is that it's not possible to be full force engaged and in interacting with false concepts and save yourself from them as well. That's not the teaching of Tazkiyah, that is 100% cure if you choose to expose yourself 100%. So a lot of Tazkiyah is also about reducing the exposure. So then it puts less effort and there's less mujahid on the nafs, less mukhalaf on the nafs. You cannot expose the nafs to every temptation and desire and then expect the teachings of Tazkiyah and Islam will be able to 100% counter that because a fundamental first foundational teaching of Tazkiyah is to safeguard and protect yourself from those false things. We make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant each and every one of us Tazkiyah wa akhirat da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.